Welcome to Keep the Faith Ministry. Keep the Faith brings you timely messages with in-depth spiritual analysis of current events in light of Bible prophecy so you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. Listen to what the news won't tell you. Here is another important message for our times. This is Pastor Hal Mayer. Dear friends, thank you for joining us. This month I am very pleased to bring you an important message on the educational system of ancient Babylon. The Bible is full of living counsel which helps us understand our times. For instance, if we are watching, we can see the principles of ancient Babylon played out in modern Babylon. But before we begin our message for today, I want to remind you that you need to renew your subscription if you have not done so already, so that the end time CDs from Keep the Faith will continue to come to your home. Please fill out the yellow card today and send it back to us immediately. We don't want to lose anyone that wants to continue to receive the messages packed with spiritual blessings and useful information for you in these last days. All of our subscriptions are free of charge with no obligation though we greatly appreciate any support you can send. Also, please share these CDs with others and encourage them to sign up for their own subscription. One further suggestion is that you should visit our website. If you hear anything in the sermons that you receive from us each month that you would like to verify or document from publicly available sources, you will find links to all of our documentation included in the relevant sermon text online. It is easy then to go directly to the source. You will also find additional prophetic intelligence briefings online that are not on our sermon CDs for lack of space. Now, as we begin our message for today, let us ask God's blessing as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love and the sacrifice of Jesus in redeeming us from sin. Thank you for giving us victory over the adversary in and all his minions. We know that in Christ's power and love, we can overcome all the forces of evil and live in the light of your commandments and the cross. As we study today, I pray that your Holy Spirit will enlighten our minds so that we will understand the principles that stand behind both ancient and modern Babylon. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us begin today by reading a passage from Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 15. God doesn't do anything important to his church without revealing it through his prophets in ample time so that his people can repent and prepare. God was pleading with Israel to turn from their idolatry and backsliding and return to God. It was God's last call. Here is what Jeremiah said under the pen of inspiration in chapter 5, verse 15. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from afar, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandeth what they say. Jeremiah was writing for his own time and the time of Israel before their Babylonian captivity. But did you know that Jeremiah also wrote these things more for our time than his own? Listen to this interesting statement from God's Last Day Messenger in the Signs of the Times, January 13, 1898. The prophets of God spoke less for their own time than for the ages to come, and especially for the generation that would live amid the last scenes of this earth's history. The Apostle Peter wrote of the prophets in 1 Peter 1, verse 12, Not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister. The message of Jeremiah is particularly relevant to those living in the very last days. Spiritual Babylon is rising, but most people don't want to hear of it. Leaders and people continue to follow after their own gods, gods of materialism, entertainment, popularity, fashion, indulgence of appetite, etc. Israel's gods in the time of Jeremiah have their parallel today, and God's message is the same today. Repent and return, he says. Through Ezekiel he said, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? 
Friends, the same message is for us. Spiritual Babylon will arise and oppress God's church. How much easier it would be if God's people were faithful to Him, if they followed His counsel in their schools, hospitals, publishing houses, churches, and families. Under wicked kings, Israel and Judah rebelled against the plain counsel of the Lord, and God sent them into captivity to Babylon. This has its parallel in the end times too, my friends. God is about to bring a great crisis upon the church. It will be a crisis that shakes everything and everyone to the foundations. Spiritual Babylon's power will be mighty. She will oppress God's people spiritually and physically. They will pass through the tribulation. But if they have prepared, they will be spared by God's protection. As a man spareth his own son. Malachi 3.17 We have this very interesting statement also in the book Great Controversy, page 625. Only those who have been diligent students of the Scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. I think it is important to understand this word shielded. You actually have to be protected by God. It's not a matter of merely knowing the scriptures. It's not merely an intellectual knowledge of the truth that will protect you. You must love Jesus, who is the truth, with all your heart. Through his grace and power, you must love and obey his law, which is the transcript of his character. Then you will be shielded by divine power in the coming confusion and chaos. Otherwise, you cannot survive spiritually. In ancient Babylon, God had Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, children of nobility, princes of the, lo- of the royal family. They were actually relatives of the wicked kings, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. These men purposed in their hearts, we are told in Daniel 1 verse 8, that they would allow nothing to defile their bodies or their souls. God worked miracles for them so they could honor Him. Similarly today, there are those who are determined in their hearts to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and choose to follow Him all the way in their daily lives. He will work miracles for and through them too. The book of Daniel is a book written for those living in the last days and is of great spiritual importance to us. It contains principles as well as prophecies. The principles of education revealed in the book of Daniel are given to help us survive the last days and withstand the enormous pressure that will be applied on God's people. If we ignore these principles, we do so to our own destruction. When Daniel and his friends, along with many other youth, were snatched from the shelter of their homes and taken to Babylon, they were put under the charge of Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs. Now, In this crisis, the results of their spiritual training at home were revealed. There can be no doubt that the lifestyle and personal habits of Daniel and his three friends, such as pure food, clean thoughts, and physical exercise, gave the Babylonians reason to put them on the list of children in whom is no blemish, but well-favored, that is, physically sound and well-built. But their good looks and bodily health was not enough. Apparently, there was some preliminary testing that took place to see which of the young men had the ability to learn the language and the so-called wisdom of Babylon, and then offer wise counsel to the king. Whatever training Daniel and his three friends had in Jerusalem, it trained them enough to be given entrance to the schools of Babylon. Ashpenaz had to find out which of these young people were skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, it says in chapter 1, verse 4. In other words, these chosen ones must have skill in discerning what is valuable knowledge and an ability to acquire it. They were also to be cunning in applying the knowledge they learned and understanding in how to classify and systematize it. Ashpenaz was impressed in the preliminary tests with their intellectual ability, and he ranked them with the best young people who would have had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. At this point, let me say a word about wisdom. 
There is a distinction between human knowledge and wisdom, and that which is gained from an experience with God. You cannot have this deeper knowledge without a walk with God every day. You can only have this when you earnestly plead with God for it, and then cooperate with God in your lifestyle so that He can pour His holiness into your soul. He makes you wise unto salvation, and you become wiser than you could be otherwise in earthly and spiritual matters. You know by the still small voice when to speak and what to say, and also when to be silent but your heart must be trained to hear and understand God's voice. Otherwise, how can He prompt you to do the right thing when you're brought into an emergency? Babylon was the educational center of the world at that time. They had prestigious schools. Every great town had its library of clay tablets connected to the temple that was open to the public, which indicates apparently that the people were educated to read and write. King Nebuchadnezzar was highly educated and placed a high value on its attainment. We know this from Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. In fact, in this one verse of Scripture, we learn Nebuchadnezzar's views of education. Babylon was far in advance of the system that prevails today, even in the leading and most prestigious universities of the world. The schools of Babylon, in all their vaunted academics, however, developed pride, love of pleasure, and arrogance. It tended to train the upper class to oppress the lower class, and many eked out an existence little better than slaves. Worse yet, the Babylonian schools mixed, mixed paganism, sorcery, and superstition with the educational curriculum, and this would train Daniel and his friends against the principles of holiness unto the Lord. It would corrupt them and educate them to think and act like Chaldeans. This they could not afford to allow. They had to be protected from this, and their minds had to be at their peak efficiency to discern the truth from the error. They had cultivated simplicity, courtesy, gentleness, and self-sacrifice. They were men of prayer, and they pled with God to protect them from corruption. They knew how much the wisdom of God far exceeded the wisdom of Babylon, so they purposed in their hearts not to defile themselves with anything that would degrade their sensibility to God's voice. They had to purpose in their hearts to obey God at every turn. They had to train themselves to hear His voice amid all the din and confusion of other voices around them. The first test of their character, however, was after they had been tested in their general knowledge wisdom, and skill, and had been chosen to be part of the Babylonian training. The king intended to bestow honor on the youth brought to Babylon, and he wanted them to have the best physical and mental development that could be attained, so that they could be the best that they could be in the royal palace. Therefore he appointed what he thought was best for them, the very things which he ate and drank, but this would train them to be self-indulgent and develop a taste for rich and harmful foods and other luxuries. Furthermore, Daniel and his friends knew that they could not eat this food or drink this wine, because in doing so they would be acknowledging the gods of Babylon and sending a wrong testimony of their faith to the Babylonians. But the greatest fear was that they would compromise their sensibilities and no longer be able to hear the voice of God. The other Hebrews thought differently. They saw that their lives would be in danger if they rejected the kindness and benevolence of the king. They feared to insult him, so instead they chose to insult Jehovah and ate the king's food. Friends, God asks us in these last days to give up those things which will in any way check the flow of the Holy Spirit through our minds. Those living in the last days must have a mature faith. This means that they must have a mature lifestyle. This is the reason for careful obedience to the laws of health and temperance. Indulgence of appetite was the way Satan successfully tempted our first parents in the Garden of Eden to sin, and it is the way in which he will entrap many otherwise good people in the last days. God will also test his people just as he tested Daniel and his companions. A voluntary self-control of appetite lies at the foundation of every reform. You must get control of your appetite by the grace of God if you want to be eternally saved. Not because what you eat will save you, 
but because the indulgence of appetite leads to sin. It means very much to be true to God. It is an experience that few appreciate. But if you do learn how to have it, you will be an instrument in the hands of God to do a powerful and mighty work, particularly under the power of the latter rain. Daniel approached the two officers of the court and courteously asked if they could eat only pulse and water. Pulse was vegetables and fruits. Their request for a ten-day trial was granted after some hesitation. Then the privilege of eating simple food was extended throughout their training. God blessed them and made them prosper in Babylon, even in Babylon's worldly training environment. Let us try to understand the thinking of the Babylonians and their goals for the nations that they conquered. It was the purpose of King Nebuchadnezzar to make one huge, harmonious empire. This meant that he not only had to defeat the nations in battle and subject them to Babylonian control, but he also had to globalize the politics of all the nations he conquered. He wanted to get everyone thinking and acting in uniform ways. He was an ancient social engineer. He did three things. First, he established an imperial system of political order that included an intricate array of officials, including the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs. They're all listed in chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Many of these officials were these young leaders that Babylon had trained for service to the king. Secondly, King Nebuchadnezzar had to globalize the economy so that everything followed the new world order that he had established. That's one of the reasons why the treasurers were all called to the worship of the great image in chapter 3. Notice that in this way, the economy was directly connected to their religion. Thirdly and ultimately, it was Nebuchadnezzar's purpose to bring about a global or empire-wide religion, a religious nationalism. This religion, like so many other pagan religions, was rooted in the worship of the sun. The religions of other nations had to be ecumenically harmonized with Babylon's religion, and once that was accomplished, everyone could worship at the same shrine or in the same way. Many of these religions were not that far removed from Babylon's religion. They worshipped the sun god. They had similar rites, rituals, feasts, and festivals. They were relatively easy to integrate. But the Jews were a different story. Their religion was so different that it was a much more challenging task. Perhaps the greatest distinction was the keeping of the Sabbath. Let me point out that this is paralleled in modern Babylon. The conquest today is not with arms and missiles, tanks and bombers. It is with craft, manipulation, policy and politics on a global scale. The papacy is encouraging and assisting world political leaders in establishing a modern empire under the Babylonian principles of worship that are essentially the same as ancient Babylon, including political, economic, and religious globalism. It involves the worship of the sun god, as represented in the symbols of Roman Catholicism, and in the methods of worship used in her churches, and in particular, Sunday worship. Modern social engineers, such as world elites and globalists, like their ancient counterparts, want to establish a world government or another world empire that will once again assimilate all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples into one common principle of worship. They want one world government, one world economy, and one world religion. And the papacy is skillfully positioning herself to manage the new empire, at least from behind the scenes. That's what the scripture tells us there in Revelation 13 and 18. There is arising a new religious nationalism, and those who aren't going along with this new global agenda will be considered to be disloyal citizens. More importantly, those that don't go along with the universal Sunday laws will find themselves in prison, in torture chambers, and under other forms of persecution. For Rome is preparing, we are told, to revive her former persecutions in the secret recesses of her massive institutions. That's from the book Great Controversy, page 581. Perhaps the best example of this assimilation in relation to modern Babylon is the ecumenical movement. 
The idea behind the ecumenical movement is essentially a religious nationalism. Rome is attempting to draw all the churches together in ecumenical activities and dialogue so that she can neuter their distinctive voice and remove any opposition to her teachings and practices. Many of them are not that far removed from Romanism. After all, they mostly all observe Sunday, the sign of Rome's authority. She wants them all to be saying the same things and thinking the same way. And once they're all speaking and thinking in uniformity, there is then no distinctive teachings that create any division between the churches. They can then become instruments of the religious nationalism to promote and even help enforce the observance of religious rights that will by law be imposed upon the nations. A world empire with a world religion will then become possible. Gradually, step by step, this is successfully being brought into place. Once everyone is on the same principle, the Holy See will have sway with the nations and succeed in requiring all to worship in the same way. Another example of the idea of religious nationalism, of modern Babylon, is the statements of Pope Benedict in September of 2007, calling on the nation of Austria to cherish its Christian heritage. To the diplomatic corps, he said, much of what Austria is and possesses it owes to the Christian faith. And Austria without a vibrant Christian faith would no longer be Austria. During his homily at Mass while visiting the shrine at Mariazell, he added the one element upon which Rome intends to unite all the nations, and which is the key ingredient of Babylon's religious nationalism, Sunday observance. Give the soul its Sunday. Give Sunday its soul, he said. It should be pointed out that this idea of religious nationalism, which has as its goal a conformity or uniformity of culture and religion, is a global concept, not linked to any particular nation, except the Vatican or the Holy See. It is transnational. In other words, it bypasses national or geographical borders and is linked not to one's own country, but to the Holy See. Moreover, it educates the student to be a servant of God or a servant of the gods. Religious nationalism turns ordinary people into defenders of the faith. As servants of God or the servants of the gods, they do the bidding of the common religious authority. This was the goal of the educational plan of both ancient and modern Babylon. Ancient Babylon accomplished this by importing international students to study in Babylon and then use them to promote and develop the Babylonian culture and education among their own people. They chose the nobility. After all, once educated in Babylonian ways and means, they would have more credibility with their own people and perhaps would be more effective in neutralizing their own nationalism and replacing it with Babylonian nationalism. Moreover, some of them, at least, would be in a position to help the king work through any issues that might arise related to the integration of the Hebrews into Babylonian culture and religion. This is clear from the scripture itself. Daniel 1, verses 3 and 4 tell us that they needed to have the ability to stand in the king's palace. To stand before the king in ancient Babylon would be a great privilege, Yet these students were to be the servants of a religious nationalism that worked to absorb God's people into Babylonian philosophy and culture. To Daniel and his three friends, this would be a literal impossibility. But to the other Hebrews, it was a necessity. These Hebrews were offered privileges and honor in exchange for their loyalty. They would be educated in all areas of Babylonian life and culture science, and logic, as well as the mysteries of the Babylonian religion, but they were expected to obey. Note the following statement about those living at the time when the Sunday movement becomes bold against commandment keepers. It is from Great Controversy, page 607. Note what is offered to some. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. 
Did you hear that? History repeats itself. Like the Hebrew children, they will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. In other words, some will be bribed. In exchange for their loyalty and support for the Sunday Law movement, they will be offered positions of influence so that they can be used to sway others. I'll read on. But their steadfast answer is, Show us from the word of God our error. I like that. God will have a faithful people who will not conform to the ecumenical religious nationalism that wants to bring them all into conformity to the Holy See. The intentions of this religious nationalism became more clear in ancient Babylon over the years, both on the plain of Dura before the great image and at the time of Darius, when Daniel was threatened with death by lions. God made it clear who was in charge by protecting these men from execution. Now, in modern Babylon, the same principle is unfolding. There is a steady and sometimes stealthy attempt to legally restore the ancient religion of Babylon involving Sunday worship. Again, there will be an attempt to educate God's people in the ecumenical way. You can see it happening in many parts of God's church today. Yet there will be those who will refuse to go along with it, though sadly, many will accept this uniformity to avoid the disadvantages. There is yet another idea in this principle of religious nationalism. Ancient Babylon, as an empire, was concerned about all the nations and tongues and peoples under its rule. Babylonian education, culture, and religion was for the common good, for all people, and therefore needed to be brought to them, if not by persuasion, then by force. Modern Babylon, by comparison, has the same idea. The Brotherhood of Humanity as it is called, is in a struggle against the evil in the world. The best and only solution, according to the papacy, is to homogenize or conform all people of all races and all nations into one system of understanding. This would prevent wars, conflicts, and schism, and promote the common good united under one God, the Pope of Rome. In this idea is contained the principle of wealth redistribution for the benefit of the poor. The idea of the common good is that all members of society work together for the benefit of all. It is a socialistic concept that requires a centralized global authority to control the politics, economics, and religion of the empire according to moral principles guided by the religious authority, just as in ancient Babylon. In this system, each individual helps all, and the collective society helps the individual. While there is some good in this principle, there is a dark side. In an evil world, the empire is controlled by a few elite men who are determined to conform everyone to certain principles that defy the law of God. This is where the problem was for Daniel and his three friends, and this is the problem for God's people in the last days. Today, modern Babylon is again advo advocating a global authority to guide the economics and politics of the world, according to moral principles, principles which the Holy See is positioning herself to define as the moral authority of the world. She works with the merchants of the earth, such as the central bankers, and the kings of the earth, or the rulers, to engage them in the process of restructuring the global economy. The Holy See works with the nations to promote a globalism that enhances her position as the spiritual mother of all. Babylonian education required that individuality be trained away from independent expression in exchange for the common expression with all the rest of society. Hebrew education was exactly the opposite because it trained the individual to exercise his independence and individuality. Without this independence, the Hebrew system would not flourish. God's plan was to educate his people to think for themselves, reason from cause to effect, and develop a love and loyalty to God that prevented apostasy both on an individual basis and on a church-wide basis. The human tendency to conform was always at odds with the principle of a divinely guided individuality. 
Modern Babylon attempts to do the same as ancient Babylon by training the individual to think like everyone else and conform to social norms that limit or prevent certain types of individual expression. If you do not conform to these demands, you are ostracized, unrecognized, and unacknowledged. The training of Babylon was rather elaborate. It involved many disciplines from sciences, math, languages, political science, history, law, military strategy, to public affairs and religion or theology. But it also involved training in observation, judgment, prudence, and discernment. It also taught its students how to think in the Babylonian way. It was considered that three years would be sufficient time to acquire these skills if the candidates had sufficient aptitude. They also had to learn the difficult and complex Chaldean and Aramaic languages. This was foundational to all other studies. Their training likely involved mental exercises, like solving puzzles or riddles, etc. During their specialized education, the trainees covered a lot of ground and applied themselves diligently and mastered it. Moreover, they learned to articulately transmit that knowledge to others. Also, Babylonian astronomers had reached a very high degree of development. They could, for instance, predict both lunar and solar eclipses by computation. Their mathematical skills were also highly developed. They used formulas that were as advanced as the Greek mathematicians. Moreover, the Babylonians were good architects and builders, as witnessed by the famed hanging gardens and beautiful building designs discovered by archaeologists. They were reasonably good physicians, having discovered by research and repeated demonstration the cures for many diseases. These things were part of their educational system, for why would these things be developed without imparting them to succeeding generations? These are, no doubt, the branches of learning that Daniel and his friends and other captives learned in the school of Nebuchadnezzar, and it was no doubt in these branches of learning in which Daniel and his friends exceeded the Babylonians. Magic, sorcery, astrology, and their related superstitions were very inexact matters and involved guesswork and supposition. Worse, their connection to the false religion of Babylon made them all the more odious to the faithful Hebrews. But the impressive mind of Daniel standing before the king no doubt made Nebuchadnezzar admire him greatly, greatly enough to place him and his companions in his cabinet of advisors and eventually to oversee the vast number of Chaldeans in the realm. No doubt Babylon provided these young men with educational books and good teachers who used the best-known methods of teaching— but three years may seem too short to qualify these men for service to the king, when they were starting from the very beginning to learn the language, plus all the information and knowledge and wisdom, to be ten times greater in understanding than all the magicians and astrologers in the realm. Humanly speaking, this would have been impossible. But it is quite a testimony to the power of God." No doubt he gave them special grace and a special portion of his Holy Spirit to guide them and help them learn quickly, taking the key ideas and issues and applying them diligently. He gave them fantastic memories and huge capacity for acquiring, sorting, synthesizing, and applying the knowledge they gained. These men were consecrated. No doubt they could see the differences between the education of Babylon and the education they had found in God's word while at home with their mothers. They could see clearly that there was a wide gap between the superstition of pagan teachings and philosophy and their own. Likewise today there is a wide gap between the kind of education that God has ordained for his church and their institutions of learning and the learning in the schools of the world. For Christian schools to teach evolution, for instance, would be inappropriate. Yet it actually happens. For children from Protestant homes to attend a Jesuit college or university would be most inconsistent with the teachings of God's Word. It would be absolutely foolhardy to voluntarily place oneself in the hands of modern Babylon for training. Among the first things that the prince of the eunuchs did was to give these young men new Babylonian names. This signified a change in character. 
The fact that this was one of the first things also signifies its importance to the Babylon system of training. Their names reflected the qualities and benefits of worshipping the gods of Babylon. Since religious integration into Babylon's mysteries was the ultimate goal of the Babylonians in their dealings with other nations, particularly the Hebrews, it was vital that they have Babylonian names, and Babylonian names that reflect their gods. As they hear their names repeated in various places and settings, they would subtly become submerged into the religious thinking and feelings of the Babylonian system of religion. If these young men were going to stand as advisors to the king and help the king to integrate the Hebrew population into the Babylonian religion, these men would need to have a full complement of credentials and skills that would make them most useful to the king. Their minds would have to be absorbed in the Babylonian way of thinking so that they could represent the king before their own people, and so that they could help the government navigate through any difficulties that resulted from the religious thinking and mentality of the Hebrew people. The issue will be the same at the end of time. Though we do not place so much emphasis on the character in choosing the names of our children today, modern Babylon's purpose is still to change the character into its own likeness. Those who are preserved and who arrive at the New Jerusalem will maintain their spiritual independence and autonomy from the modern Babylonian system. They will not be swallowed up in the false worship that the Vatican will impose on the whole world. They will continue to obey God's command to keep the Sabbath of the Lord, regardless of the consequences or punishments brought upon them. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar's idea was to merge all the religions of the nations, including the Hebrew faith, into the Babylonian system of worship, by force if necessary. But the king had not reckoned that there would be those in his employ who would resist this to the death. He expected that all the young men would be grateful for the privileges and honors they would be given and would therefore be willing to support the king's agenda. Young people from other nations were also in Babylon. They were to do the same thing, but their religious background and their mentality was not so foreign to the Babylonian way. After all, they were already heathens and just needed some adjustments. But the Hebrews were quite distinct, and they would need special attention. So the Bible records for us that the finest Hebrew youth were chosen to take up that task of being retrained or reframed into good Babylonians. Today, this is much like sending Christian teachers to worldly institutions of learning or universities of the fallen churches of Babylon, where they unlearn whatever they knew or thought they knew of the message of God for the last days, and they become infiltrated with false educational ideas. They then come to teach in God's schools and bring their false ideas into the classroom and teach them to their students, thus spreading them for many years to come. Eventually they can, through this process, change God's church from one that is loyal to God to one that conforms to the ecumenical principles of Rome. These false ideas that are brought back to God's institutions of learning vary depending on the person, but could certainly include evolutionary theories, false ideas about salvation, such as the unfallen nature of Christ, or the idea that you cannot have victory over your sins through the grace of Christ, that there is no sanctuary in heaven, or the concept that all we need is love and unity. These false ideas strike at the very heart of the distinctive message God has ordained to be given in the last days. Satan's plan was to get these Hebrew young men to compromise so that they would be unable to stand firm to principle and be unable to maintain the distinctives of the Hebrew faith in heathen Babylon. The tragedy is that many of the Hebrews were quite willing to integrate into the Babylonian ecumenical spirit. They had been trained to use situational ethics as their reasoning. Situational ethics is that process where a person can justify whatever they want to do, no matter how it violates the counsel of God, on the basis that the circumstances require it, and that God will understand or overlook it and forgive you. Today, there are many that preach and teach these same principles. They excuse the people from obeying the writings of the apostles and the prophets because they supposedly wrote in the context of their own times 
and not for us in every detail, only in general principles. They teach that the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, does not need to be kept anymore, and all of this makes religion easy. The education of Daniel and his three friends in Babylon was mixed with sorcery and superstition. While the Hebrew youth would study the exact sciences and other legitimate learning, they kept themselves aloof of the heathen elements. It would have no doubt been difficult to preserve their faith in that heathen land with enormous pressure on them to conform to the customs and manners of the Chaldeans. We are not told how they avoided the common conflicts, but we do know that they held fast to their Hebrew faith. Today we have a similar problem. The education of modern Babylon has similar characteristics. Again, there is the mixture of exact sciences with superstition and speculation. For instance, modern science involves the evolutionary process, which is as speculative as anything can be. The Catholic Church has its own version of evolution. It's called deistic evolution, which is not all that far removed from the evolutionary ideas of secular scientists. The teachings of Rome also involve superstitions and heathen practices, such as praying for the dead, while in a different form they are essentially the same in principle. The educational system of the Babylonians was built on a principle of spiritualism, particularly spiritualism that predicts the future. The Babylonians were involved in divining the future by comparing the livers of dead beasts with clay model livers, or by watching how arrows fall, or by the pattern of oil spreading as it is poured on water. These magicians, astrologers, and other diviners also interpreted dreams through incantation formulas and by asking advice of the spirits of the dead. They were very interested in the future and sought guidance from the spirits so that they could navigate the future successfully. Their educational system was deeply embedded with these principles. And while Daniel and his friends avoided this sort of nonsense, they were nevertheless surrounded by it and learned very quickly of the interest that the Babylonians had in prognostications of the future. This placed these men, and particularly Daniel, in a position to see the need of a true understanding of the God who reveals all necessary secrets through his prophets. God, meanwhile, was setting Daniel in place to be his prophet in Babylon. He placed Daniel close to the principles of spiritualism so that he could learn how the Chaldeans thought and how to talk to them and help them understand the true God. Moreover, Daniel was destined to rule over these Chaldeans and would have a need to understand their mentality. Human beings naturally want to know the future, since they cannot see beyond the present. They need prophecy to enlighten and guide them, and because God created man with this desire or need, he also provided prophecy in the word of God so that he can understand what is coming. That is one of the reasons why prophecy is in every book of the Bible. Satan also has his way of dealing with this innate desire to know the future. Many are led to the wrong places for a knowledge of the future, and they will pay good money for the information. There are abundant false prophets and abundant false interpretations of prophecy. If they would just diligently study their Bibles, God's people would have a knowledge that surpasses the mixture of false ideas that abound in our day. If we purpose in our hearts to live the way Daniel lived, we would be able to discern the subtle mixture of truth and error in most systems of philosophy. Modern Babylon, my friends, is much the same today. Spiritualism is one of the key principles developed in the last days, and modern spiritualism is presented in a very attractive form. Many people, for instance, believe that the spirits of their dead relatives are hovering over them, or that they can feel their presence in the room with them. Moreover, many more are simply placated by spiritual leaders, priests, and pastors who tell them that everyone is going to be saved and that they don't need to worry themselves about the future. Or they are told that so long as they are baptized in the church, they will be saved. Notice that when they were tested by the king, he found these four men ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. 
This tells us that apparently Nebuchadnezzar's expectation was that eventually, as these men got more experienced in the Babylonian ways, they would be involved in the speculative and superstitious knowledge of Babylonian spiritualism and the divining of the future and guide him through difficult passages in his leadership as king. But Daniel had something infinitely better. He could offer the king a knowledge of the future rooted in the infallible and unchangeable word of God. As God's prophet, he could guide the king concerning the future with certainty, quite unlike those Chaldean diviners. But perhaps we can learn from the story why Daniel and his friends survived. First, they had educated themselves to have a firm resolution to remain true to God. Daniel purposed in his heart. This was more than a mere passive desire. They actively willed to do the right and shun the wrong. Victory was only possible by the right action of the will. Second, their dependence on God brought upon them the power of Jehovah. In chapter 2, verse 28, Daniel said to the king, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. These Hebrews knew that they had to work diligently and that human effort was necessary, yet they knew that it would be worthless if they did not rely on God for power. Third, they refused to blunt their spiritual and moral powers by indulgence and appetite in even one single instance. This was vital to their success. And fourth, they maintained a consistent prayer life. Victory cannot come in life without consistent prayer for wisdom to navigate the difficulties and temptations. Little did Nebuchadnezzar realize who was standing before him during the final exam. Here was a representative of the God of heaven, the God he did not know the God whose will he was unknowingly fulfilling. Daniel and his friends excelled in Babylon by being faithful to God. When modern Babylon reaches its peak of power, will God have people alive that will again stand for truth and righteousness? Will he have Daniels whom he can bless with important responsibilities? The lesson of the educational system of Babylon is put on record because it is God's object lesson for us today. The relation of the Jews to Babylon is the same that God's faithful people, the true Israel, have to the modern churches of our day. The sins of ancient Babylon will be repeated today because the educational system today is the same. It exalts the human through sports, through the honor system, through modern philosophy, evolutionary science, superstition, entertainment, and much, much more. But friends, I pray that you will purpose in your heart not to be defiled by Chaldean teaching and Babylonian living. The call today is to come out of her, my people, that ye partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we see the developments of modern Babylon in our day, attempting to get everyone to conform to the worldly and corrupted principles of thinking. We want to be like Jesus and think like Him. Please send your Holy Spirit to help us see the ways in which we are still like Babylon in our minds and hearts. Purify us, we pray, so that when we are tried, we may be made white. Let Jesus reign in us, is my prayer. In his precious name I pray. Amen. Oh, let me walk with thee, my God, as Enoch walked in days of old. Place thou my trembling Let me walk with thee. I can't.
hope that you have been greatly blessed by this month's message. Your prayers and gifts mean much to us. Thank you for your support. The following is our monthly prophetic intelligence briefing, a feature that brings you current events in light of prophecy, especially for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. We can see the signs of the times telling us that we are nearing the world's great crisis. May the Lord find us faithful. Our first item this month, Papal Encyclical Urges World Political Authority. The new Papal Encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, Charity and Truth, released on July 7, 2009, is a social statement of the papal views on the economy and other social issues. In it, Benedict called for a world political authority, wrote the Edmonton Journal, to manage the global economy. The Pope said that the world political authority would have to be regulated by law and would need to be universally recognized and be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. In other words, the Pope is calling on the nations of the world to recognize a world political authority and give it legal powers to control the global economy. This is consistent with the recent plan of the G20 meeting that was held in London in April. Essentially, the Pope is calling for the globalization of politics, which is already a long way toward being implemented, and the economy, which is now in the process of being developed through the G20 and other internationalist organizations. The construction of the three-legged stool, global politics, economy, and religion, requires international bodies that control all social and economic life on the planet. The papal interest in this is central to the fulfillment of prophecy. There can be no globalized religion if there is no globalized politics and economy. The Pope conveniently blames unbridled capitalism and unregulated market forces, which led to a thoroughly destructive abuse of the system, saying that the current economic crisis is clear proof of what he branded as pernicious effects of sin in the economy. Socialism has a different set of abuses that are just as destructive, but that is not the subject of Caritas in Veritate. The economy needs ethics in order to function correctly. Not any ethics whatsoever, but an ethics which is people-centered, the Pope said. The papacy is referring to ethics defined by Rome, not by the international bodies that would control the world economy. 
USA Today, was more pointed. Pope Benedict XVI today called for reforming the United Nations and establishing a true world political authority with real teeth to manage the global economy with God-centered ethics. He also said that to reach a sound global economy, every responsibility and commitment must be rooted in the values of Christian truth. In other words, the world political authority should develop its ethics and rules around papal pronouncements and definitions. Without that, he says, there is no social conscience and responsibility. He added that though the church has no technical solutions to offer, he asserts that religion has a role in the public square. In other words, the Vatican is demanding a role in regulating world politics and economy based on its Christian ethics. The Holy See is trying to become the moral authority of the world. He also said that previous economic, social, and political systems trample upon personal and social freedom and are therefore unable to deliver the justice that they promise. The new global authority, he said, should revive damaged economies, reach toward disarmament, food security, and peace, protect the environment, and regulate migration. In other words, the Pope is urging that all these areas of life should be controlled by global authorities. Even the ability to move from one place in the world to another should be managed, as well as the food we eat and the way we spend our money. Yes, he even mentioned the way individuals, as well as industry and governments, use their money should be regulated. The Pope's views, says political scientist Thomas Rees, a Jesuit priest and senior fellow at the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., are to the left of Obama in terms of economic policy, particularly in calls for redistribution of wealth. The papacy has been pressing for a redistribution of wealth for quite some time. This means taking money away from the wealthy nations and giving it to poor nations. This is done through taxation and various domestic and global aid packages. But taxation is a drag on the economy, so there is a lot of pressure against more taxes. The overall intention is to bring the United States and other wealthy nations to a lower standard of living. The Pope also called for a greater role for trades unions. Trade unions should be honored today even more than in the past, wrote Benedict, as a prompt and far-sighted response to the urgent need for new forms of cooperation at the international level, as well as the local level. In other words, trade unions should take on a more international and global role, thus expanding their power and influence. Rome knows which organizations will help her accomplish her goals. Trade unions are apparently among them. If Rome helps the trade unions, they will help her. Many leaders and members of trade unions are Roman Catholic, giving Rome more power if trade union policies are implemented on a global basis. Trade unions will be formed, wrote Ellen White in Country Living, page 10, and those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. Remember, it was the trade unions in Poland that worked with Solidarity and Pope John Paul II to destabilize the communist regime that led to the collapse of the European communist system. Rome is constantly uniting with trade unions to promote her agenda. Even as recently as the push for Sunday rest laws in Europe late last year, the trade unions united with the Vatican and other churches to pressure Parliament to protect Sunday as a day of rest. This is also prophetic. The trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as has not been since the world began. Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 88. Satanic agencies are becoming more determined in their rebellion against God, the trade unions will be the cause of the most terrible violence that has ever been seen among human beings. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 23. With all the talk about the economy and wealth redistribution, 
It is not apparent that the Catholic Church intends to sell some of her valuable paintings and release some of her gold bullion to charitably assist developing countries out of their economic crisis. Apparently, the Church sees this as the work of wealthy nations other than Rome. Rome is seeking to control and manage the nations through her claims to moral principles, but hardly is she willing to reduce her own standard of living and wealth in order to lead the way. Caritas in Veritate is really quite empty of genuine leadership. This hypocrisy goes unnoticed by most of the media. Next, Medvedev shows off sample coin of new world currency at G8. On July 10, Bloomberg reported that Russian President Dmitry Medvedev unveiled a new supranational currency to replace the dollar by pulling from his pocket a sample coin of a united future world currency. Here it is, Medvedev told reporters in L'Aquila, Italy, as he proudly displayed the coin after the G8 summit. You can see it and touch it. The coin is inscribed with the words Unity in Diversity and was minted in Belgium and was presented to the heads of the G8 delegations. The question of a supranational currency concerns everyone now, even the mints, Medvedev said. The test coin means they're getting ready. I think it's a good sign that we understand how interdependent we are. Medvedev was repeatedly calling for Medvedev has repeatedly called for creating a mix of regional reserve currencies as part of the drive to address the global financial crisis, said Bloomberg. Russia's proposal for the G20 meeting in London in April included the creation of a supranational currency. However, reported the China Daily, those who have downplayed the formulation of a world currency by dismissing it as merely a progression of SDRs, or special drawing rights, and not something that would physically be used by citizens in a system of world government, were contradicted when Medvedev clearly outlined that the new currency would be used for payment by citizens as a united future world currency. American economists such as Ben Bernanke and Timothy Geithner deny that there were plans to create a world currency. However, said China Daily, just days after he told a congressional hearing that there were no plans to move towards a global currency, Geithner sought to please the elitist CFR by assuring them that he was open to the notion of a new global currency system. As far back as 2006, the highly secretive Bank for International Settlements, considered to be the world's top central banking power hub, released a policy paper in 2006 that called for the end of national currencies in favor of a global model of currency formats. Geithner would have known about that. A world currency could simplify commerce and trade, but it would also be a cornerstone of a one-world government. Eventually, a single global currency would simplify the fulfillment of Revelation 13, verse 17, which says that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Next, U.S. government gives $100 million of taxpayer money to Catholic Charities USA. Catholic News Agency reported on August 4 that Catholic Charities USA has received a five-year, $100 million federal contract to aid in disaster relief throughout the United States. The contract is the charity's first ever federal contract. The charity organization is 100 years old. That's approximately a million dollars for every year of their existence. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, headed by pro-abortion Kathleen Sebelius, who is a member of President Obama's cabinet, awarded the contract. The Catholic Church strongly opposes abortion. Would taking this much money from HHS be a conflict of interest for the Church? Subtly muting its voice? Could this contract be a reward for Vatican silence concerning the Obama speech at Notre Dame? Awarding such a contract to the Catholic Church is a violation of the separation of church and state. 
in spite of many arguments favoring the use of church charities for humanitarian work. Placing taxpayer money in the hands of the church repudiates the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Catholic News Agency also said that the contract allows HHS to issue task orders to the agency for aid in connection with a specific disaster. When private organizations take money from the government, it always comes with strings attached. Usually the organization has to conform to certain rules and regulations. Since this money is related to family services, would this lead to a conflict over the church's position on abortion, gay marriage, and other family life issues, and directives from the HHS? Father Larry Snyder, the Catholic Charities USA president and CEO, said, We all hope and pray for zero disasters, but reality forces us to be prepared, he said. People know they can turn to Catholic charities to get the job done. We thank the Department of Health and Human Services for their confidence in us. Father Snyder characterized the contract as a very strong endorsement of who we are and what we do, and and powerful recognition of the donors who support us. So this huge amount of money is the way in which the Obama administration expresses its confidence in the Roman Catholic Church and its image in the United States through its charity agencies. While Catholic Charities does much good, up until now it has been getting private donations to do its work. CCUSA, or Catholic Charities, which is among the top five largest nonprofit charities in the country, says it will reach out to its counterparts, such as the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and others, to establish any mutual engagement opportunities. Would that include Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, another major charity? Historically, a cozy relationship to secular governments has always been a priority where possible for the Vatican. Will this contract lead to more influence of the Roman Catholic Church in the U.S. government? Next, papal meeting cause for celebration? On July 20, 2009, the Jesuit America magazine published an article which said essentially that U.S. President Barack Obama and Benedict XVI seemed like two well-acquainted statesmen when they met recently in Rome. Then a revealing statement was made. Some of their unexpected familiarity is due to the diligent work of Vatican diplomats, who in recent years have done much behind the scenes to engage American officials and to establish dialogue between the American public figures and their Vatican counterparts. Though the political relationship between the United States and the Holy See has until recent years been an uneasy one, The sight of an American president happily and respectfully greeting the Pope is an occasion for celebration on more than one level, wrote the magazine. And all the world wondered after the beast, Revelation 13.3. Next, Stephen Harper wonders after. Stephen Harper capped four days of high-level meetings Saturday with a visit to Pope Benedict XVI's Vatican Palace wrote the London Globe and Mail, where the two men discussed the pontiff's recent appeal for economic reforms based on strong moral values. Mr. Harper, along with his wife, Laureen, and his two children, Ben and Rachel, spent about an hour at the palace. It was an honor to meet Pope Benedict and hear his perspective on a number of important issues, including human rights and an ethical response to the global economic crisis, said Mr. Harper. I expressed my deep appreciation for the Holy Father's oral and humanitarian leadership as an advocate of human dignity, peace, and religious liberty, and for the spiritual leadership he provides to Catholics in Canada and throughout the world. Mr. Harper, himself a Protestant, spent about 90 minutes with the Pope. He also met with Tarsicio Cardinal Bertoni, the Vatican Secretary of State. Next, Kevin Rudd wonders after. Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, a Roman Catholic, had a private meeting with Benedict XVI on his way to the G8 summit in La Chia, Italy. The two discussed climate change and interfaith issues, said the BBC on July 9. 
The media cover for the meeting was a discussion about the possible sainthood of Mother Mary MacKillop, an Australian nun that had some alleged accomplishments. As usual, they also exchanged gifts. Next, Germany hijacks the EU. In a stealth ruling, the German High Court has declared that Germany can only ratify the Lisbon Treaty if an accompanying law is passed in Germany that gives the German Parliament oversight of EU laws. In essence, the court ruled that by passing the so-called accompanying law to the Lisbon Treaty, wrote Spiegel Online, which determines the rights of German Parliament to participate in European legislation, the representatives had relinquished significant monitoring rights to Brussels. According to the judges, this unconstitutionally subjects the people that they represent to the whims of a bureaucracy in Brussels that lacks sufficient democratic legitimacy. In other words, the German High Court said that the law already passed that is to accompany ratification of the Lisbon Treaty is unconstitutional because it does not require that Germany have the maximum rights in the EU Parliament to monitor, or that is to approve or disapprove, EU laws. In reality, what Germany wants is for the Lisbon Treaty to be ratified only under condition that the new EU treaty would only be valid in Germany in accordance with the decision of the German Constitutional Court. They are now demanding a solution that gives maximum parliamentary influence over future EU policy. This is another major step in placing Germany at the head of a united Europe. Germany is flexing its muscle again by carving out its place at the head of the European Union. If the new accompanying law is passed, no EU law can be in force in Germany unless Germany agrees to it. And if Germany doesn't agree to it, how can EU laws be enforced on the rest of Europe? United Germany has the political and economic clout to achieve it. While this could undermine efforts to ratify the Lisbon Treaty among a few other nations that have yet to do so. It isn't likely. Germany is moving ahead with ratification once a new law is written and passed, giving Germany legal monitoring authority in the EU Parliament in Brussels. Germany is making this law as a condition of its being a signatory to the treaty. If the EU wants Germany involved, it will have to accept these conditions. Germany did not ratify the Lisbon Treaty in 2008 like many other EU nations. Berlin waited until political developments revealed the best way to position Germany as the political power broker. In other words, if Germany succeeds in passing the new law yet to be drafted, every EU law, no matter how big or how small, will have to go on a detour through Germany's democratic process first before it becomes EU law. Germany will then be able to accept or reject EU laws according to its own interests. This political bombshell may not have dawned on EU leaders yet, but it will in due time. How can the EU resist Germany's demands when it is the largest and most powerful political and economic force in Europe? The conditions posed by the court in Karlsruhe, wrote Spiegel, will make things much more difficult than we had imagined, the leaders of the conservative parliamentary group admitted late last week. Despite the premature cries of triumph among staunch EU supporters in the ruling coalition and in Brussels, last Tuesday's ruling on the Lisbon Treaty will yet unleash rage and tears of frustration. Now that the court in Karlsruhe has spelled out Germany's role in European unification, continued Spiegel, this heralds the end of a policy of increasing integration of Europe. According to the judges, Germany's future lies not in a united Europe, but rather in Germany. In the future, the most powerful EU partner will also be the most difficult one. It simply means that the court assumes the right to single-handedly determine the boundaries of European integration, in a broad sense and, if necessary, in detail. The German Constitutional Court has essentially declared itself the highest supervisory body in conflicts between Germany and the EU, and thus explicitly placed itself above the European Court of Justice. 
Furthermore, wrote Spiegel, the judicial supremacy of the ECJ is only valid within the boundaries defined by the court in Karlsruhe, and the Lisbon Treaty is only compatible with the German Constitution within the confines of the Karlsruhe interpretation. One of the arguments of the German Constitutional Court is that the EU Parliament is notoriously non-democratic in spite of claims to the contrary and that it needs Germany's oversight to keep it in line so that German people are not subjected to laws they don't want. In effect, Germany is saying that the EU is not a state but an association of states. This point is important because this seriously limits the Parliament from legislating laws that apply within Germany and consequently within other member states and restricts its laws that operate across borders. And it also restricts the ECJ, that's the European Court of Justice, from enforcing EU laws without Germany's approval. The areas that the German Court especially claims as national tasks not EU tasks, include citizenship, use of force, the national budget, fundamental rights, including accommodation of professions of faith, etc. What appears to be emerging is a European Union stripped of many of its most prized powers and the control of every aspect of European life. Perhaps this is the means the angels will use to hold back the winds of strife in Europe by delaying the EU assumption of dictatorial power for now. Instead, that power is, for the time being, going to be rooted in Germany with strong nationalistic tendencies. This will consequently give the other nations of the EU the ability to exercise their own independence from EU control. The identity of the German constitutional order may not be damaged by Brussels, said Spiegel. Identity takes priority over integration. Former constitutional judge Paul Kirchhoff said that there will be no European state under the provisions of the German Constitution. Keep the Faith has been saying for some time that Germany already dictates EU foreign policy as well as domestic policy. Now it is going to be codified in German law and in EU practice. A united Germany was the political and economic leader of the Holy Roman Empire during the Dark Ages. Now, once again, it is becoming obvious that the reunited Germany will likely play that role again. History repeats itself. God has many ways and means to slow down the progress of fulfilling prophecy, yet we must be on our guard. All of it can change very quickly under the pressure of a huge crisis. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Unfortunately, our time has run out. Be sure to go to our website and read more of our prophetic intelligence briefings. It has been a great pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope that you have been encouraged to live for Jesus, for we are near the end. Thank you for your prayers and support. And until next time, may God bless and keep you and your family in His loving and protecting care. Keep the faith.